So I'm Simon Cardy. I work at the Quantum Institute. I'm also a UEA employee, so hence the two titles I have. So welcome to Quadram. So if it's your first visit, this is a relatively new institution. We've only been here since April. And I think you probably if you came through the front door, you'll see that we have the NHS below, research labs above. So this is a, a new experiment for research funding and research institutes in the UK. So we are government funded principally. We are not working for any biopharmaceutical company. We are in, pretty much entirely government funded to do research on gut microbes, food and health. So ME is a sort of extension of what we're doing. Um, and the, most of our research is funded by Invest in ME Research, which you'll hear more about as we go through the presentations. So the purpose of this event is to publicize a very exciting and innovating trial that we're undertaking here at the Quadram as an intervention to hopefully treat ME. So uh, there'll be lots of information that we presented. I'm going to give an overview uh, and describe the trial in its broad detail. And then we'll have presentations that relate to more specific activities and programs within the trial itself. So. Just to get you used to the click pad, uh, this is the starter question. So arm yourself with your click pad. And so the first question is, from which end do you peel a banana? Number one is at the top, number two is at the bottom. Vote now. 50, okay. There we go. 88% of you voted from the top. 12% from the bottom. So, why is that interesting? So, we generally peel a banana from the top, but monkeys peel it from the bottom. So, the 12% of you that said from the bottom, <laughs> make, make your own conclusions. Okay, so you all know how to use the devices. That's, 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 that's good. So, here's the first serious question Do you suffer from ME? One, yes, two, no, three, maybe. So we have 54, is anybody else waiting to respond? No. So 43% yes, 54% no, 4% maybe, okay. So then hopefully most of the majority of you in here will actually um, this, what we're going to talk about today will be of direct relevance to you. So next question, how long have you had or suffered from ME? One less than two years, two more than two years. And so we haven't got anything showing up for that one. Okay. Oh, everyone, sorry, missed it. Yeah, it's black. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. So a little bit of introduction. Um, about the cause, what ME is and the causes and why we're undertaking the trial. So it, it's fair to say that we still do not yet have a clear idea about what the cause of ME is here. The diagram on the slide illustrates some of the more common, I think, hypotheses as to explain what ME is. So immune dysregulation, uh, mitochondrial impairment as it relates to energy, production, utilization, intestinal dysbiosis, that means gut problems, and viral infection. And so one of the more common hypotheses is that maybe it is an infectious disease. And this relates back to more than 80 years ago when the first, if you like, outbreak of ME occurred in Los Angeles. It was originally misdiagnosed polio uh, because the symptomology resembled polio. Um, but that was later discarded. And then through subsequent outbreaks, um, it became to resemble more and more like an infectious disease. So rapidly spread in individuals living in close proximity to each other. So in hospitals um, and uh, also in neighboring towns as well. And then um, it, it took on the rather unfortunate name of Yuppie Flu um, in sort of 1984. Since then, there have been many more outbreaks, and as you see. And then in 1995, the 
the American um, Center for Disease Control actually put it onto its list of re-emerging infectious diseases. And so where we are now is that we have sort of mounting evidence that it may in fact be an infection and a virus infection that may be an important trigger for the disease. And perhaps the, the um, virus may originate in the gut. And the reason for that is shown in this little box that's appeared. Um, yep. Right there. Okay. So uh, Epstein Barr virus, um, herpes virus, parvovirus, enterovirus, and cytomegalovirus. So two of those viruses are found commonly in the GI tract, somewhere in the gut. So that's the enterovirus. Next time, bar virus. So again, this this is sort of building to a possible link to GI gut disorders that may be in part of this, and maybe a gut virus that triggers this. So, is there a gut origin for ME/CFS? And this is, I think, a summary of the current evidence in support of that idea. So, most ME patients suffer from some GI symptoms. The most common one being irritable bowel syndrome (IBS). Um, there's, as I said on the previous slide, there's a high prevalence of enterovirus infections. So entera means gut. So virus is in the gut. Um, lots of patients have a leaky gut. So things that shouldn't get into the body from the gut are getting into the body and they're chronically overstimulating the immune system. Um, increased sensitivity to food, which accompanies this um, leaky gut. And then from more recent studies where we've been looking at, well, what's in the gut and what are the microbes there, it's quite clear that the microbes in the gut of a patient with ME are different or distinct from those in healthy individuals. So again, there's something different about the population microbe in the gut. And we know from studies done in Australia around 2012 that actually if you can change the makeup of the microbes in the gut of a patient with ME, you can treat it effectively. So cumulatively, this sort of indicates that the gut might be a site or one of the origins of ME. So this is the third question for you, which again relates to the GI symptoms. So have you, as an ME patient, ever suffered from gut symptoms? And some examples are given there. So you have four options. No, never. Two, yes, before the onset. Three, after onset. Or four, before and after onset. Obviously, if you don't suffer from me, don't answer the question. So I think we're there. So the majority of you say yes, both before and after ME symptoms, which is which is interesting. 38% after onset, 8%. Never. Okay, so that's probably more or less consistent with what we understand from all the studies done today, that the majority of any patients will have GI symptoms of some description, and it may in some cases precede disease onset, but may accompany other symptoms. So that's, um, that's very good. So now we're going more into, okay, what's in your gut and what about the microbes in your gut? So as an introduction, have, how many of you have heard of the term microbiome? One yes, two no. All of you. Thank you for the prompt. Fifty-three. Okay. Ah, very good. Eighty-five percent of you. Very good. So, just as a sort of straw poll here, um, where have you heard of the term from? In the supermarket. Supermarket. Oh, sorry? Good day. Good day, okay. Anywhere else? Okay, good. Yes? Here. here. You, you've been here before, haven't you? You've been here. I recognize you. You've been here before. <laughs> Only if you can control. Ah, very good. Okay, excellent. So, a good spread. So, the information is getting out there to most people about the microbiome. So, then. Do you know why the microbiome is important? Do you know why the microbiome is important for your health and well-being? So how much do you understand about the microbiome? And why is it important? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. 
Okay. 49. Very good. Okay, yes. So, again, maybe. So, the majority of you think it's important for your health. And I, I would agree the majority is important for our health. How exactly it's important for our health, we're still investigating, but it clearly is important. So, just to give you some generalities about the microbiome. This is my one slide that summarizes the microbiome. So the microbiome describes all the microbes that live on and in your body. Um, there are more microbes than you have cells in your body. Um, and But then when you look at the number of genes all these microbes have, they vastly outnumber our own genome um, by maybe as much as 150 fold. Most of the microbes on your body live in your gut. And everybody here has their own unique populations of microbes. Everybody's distinct. So it's your microbial fingerprint, okay? Just like your fingerprint in your hand. So you have a unique microbiome that's shared, that's shared with nobody else. Um, among the microbes in your gut, viruses, you may be surprised about this, but viruses are by far the most prevalent, um, not bacteria. Most of what you probably know about the microbiome is about bacteria, is that true? So in fact, they're not the major group, it's the viruses. And most of these viruses infect bacteria. So the changes we see in bacterial population may be because viruses are killing off or changing the bacteria. Um, in terms of the bacteria, there may be as many as a thousand species. And good news is that we all have about 50, we share about 50 uh, species. And these are important because they perform an important function in digesting the food you eat. So that core is essential for digestion. And we know that um, it's important health principally through digestion, but also it interacts with the immune system and it boosts your immune system. And we also now come to think that the microbes in your gut can influence the brain, in particular in mental health, cognitive function, and they may even play a role in dementia development. And that's something we're very interested in the Quadrum Institute. Okay, so viruses, bacteria, fungi, archaea, which are very ancient bacteria, and protozoa. So they make up your microbiome. And this slide just sort of illustrates, well, you know, you have a healthy microbiome, or, or you can have what's called a dysbiotic microbiome, which means they're altered populations, and that is associated with ill health. So the key question is, what influences the balance? What keeps you healthy, and what may tip the balance the other way? to make you ill. And so this is what we know about what influences the microbiome. And some of these things you'll think, well, that's obvious. So medications, antibiotics in particular, okay? So most people take antibiotics to remove a bad bacteria, but the collateral damage is you take out quite a lot of good bacteria, particularly take lots of courses of antibiotics. Infections, so food poisoning is a very good way of changing your gut microbes, and that can be a bad thing. Our microbes change as we age, so we're born sterile, and then we start to acquire microbes depending on where we live, who we live with, um, and then as we age, it changes as well. And by the time we're uh, near the later years of life, again, we, we lost a lot of good bacteria, and that makes us prone to lots of infections, particularly virus infections. And of course, our diet is a very good way of shifting your microbiome. But interestingly, diet only works if you stay on the diet pretty much all the time. Once you come off the diet, then your microbes can readapt and reshape and then they go, can go back as they were. So diet's good, but you've got to stick with it. And we now know that most human diseases are associated with changes or shifts in your microbiome in terms of what's there and what are they doing. And ME, CFS is right at the bottom there, and we think that's also linked to this. So the key question is, well, okay, so we have an abnormal microbiome. How can we fix it? And fixing your microbiome is like lawn care, okay? So here we have a healthy lawn up here on the left. And if we take lots of antibiotics or we take the wrong type of foods, we can lose a lot of the beneficial microbes, okay? And that gives an opportunity for bad bacteria to grow more and to have a really bad effect on the body. So the options we have are we can put down new seed, lawn seed, uh, so that's probiotics. We can give back new bacteria. 
Pro prebiotics would be food, so putting down fertilizer or changing our diet. And then the more extreme one is, is digging up the lawn and putting a new lawn down. Okay. Which of these works depending, depends on you and your type of microbes and what's actually changed in your microbes to make you. So one may not necessarily be the universal medication treatment for everybody. It's personalized. And we know from studies looking at the use of probiotics in ME, the evidence is that it may be beneficial, but there's no compelling evidence that it is going to work for most people. So bacteria therapy, um, which is leading into our trial here, is called microbiota replacement therapy. That's the sort of now human equivalent of digging up your lawn and putting a new one down. And we do know, we have some evidence, again from the Australian group, that this can be successful in ME. And so FMT, so FMT, oh, I've only heard about this three, four years ago. Actually, it's been around for a long, long time. Chinese, part of Chinese medicine back in the fourth century. And then a little later, we had something called yellow dragon soup, uh, which was a cure of lots of things. And then in 1940, uh, German troops in North Africa would eat camel poop soup, soup as a cure for dysentery. And the medication that the bacteria that was active in the camel poo, they now sell as a medication and it's still available, particularly in Germany. First clinical application in 1950s, an individual called Stanley Falcao um, started to give encapsulated poo back to his surgical patients. And then a little later, an individual called Ben Eisman used it to cure patients that were near death from a very severe form of colitis. And then this is the individual who's been now um, pioneering it for ME. And he, back in 1989, he was using it to treat patients with colitis. And then working animals showed you can transfer obesity from um, in animals by taking the stool from an obese human and putting it into a mouse, and the mice become obese. Um, so that was a direct link, maybe, of the microbiome obesity. But now the thing that's underpinned a whole change in the way the NHS and, and clinical practice for FMT came in back in 2013 when FMT was used to treat patients with C. difficile infection. And the next speaker will probably go over this again. This has now been adopted as part of NHS practice for patients with recalcitrant C. difficile infection and the cure rates are phenomenal. It's over 90%. And consider the cost of drugs and the cost of FMT significant savings on the NHS there. So in terms of the future, there are lots of other target disease we think FMT could be very useful for, including ME. And this is the evidence that it might work in ME patients. So this individual here, Thomas Barodi, he's performed over 14,000 FMTs. Um, back in 2012, he took 60 ME patients. Uh, 52 of those had IBS. So again, the majority of them have GI problems. And his fix was to take 13 different types of microbes from a stool sample and put them into these patients by transcolonic infusion or by rectal infusion. And a large number of them responded. So 42 had improved sleep, uh, deprivation, fatigue, and lethargy. The majority reported being symptom-free up to 15 to 20 years follow-on. So these are individual cases, okay? And the resolution of GI symptoms is even more dramatic. The vast majority of them improve their GI symptoms. So what's needed now is a clinical trial to formally determine whether or not FMT can be an effective treatment for ME. And this is the Restore Me trial, which we want to uh, run here in the Quadrum Institute later this year. So it's a phase 2B trial. It's designed to test efficacy directly. We want to know if this works, if this can improve um, symptoms in ME patients. And that's the question we're asking. So can FMT restore a healthy microbiome in ME patients? Because all of you with ME will have an abnormal microbiome. And does this improve your physical and mental health? That's what we're testing. This is the design. So it will be performed here. It's a single site. It's randomized. So individuals in the trial will be in one of two groups, the placebo control and those that get the test sample. 
We're looking to recruit 160 patients. And again, we'll have Joe is talking later from East Coast Community Healthcare to talk about the uh, recruitment aspect of this. And the procedure will be carried out here in the downstairs in the endoscopy unit. And the donors will come from a stool bank we've already established here for the treatment of C. difficile patients in the hospital. And the next speaker in Gozi will talk a little bit more about that. The features of the trial which make it unique are that it's the first efficacy trial of its type anywhere in the world uh, for treating ME. And it's the first trial in which we'll have objective measures. So that's real measures, not just patients filling in questionnaires. We will actively quantitate the changes in your mental health and your physical activity. So it's, it's unbiased and it's real numbers. So that, again, that is a distinctive feature of the trial. So this is just a snapshot. You see at the top there, we've got a lot. It's a huge team of people that will be involved in this. The ones in red are the people that will speak after me about different aspects of this. So basically, it will be prior to actually receiving the treatment, there'll be a battery of tests to establish the baseline values, then undergo the FMT, and then we'll follow on at intervals up to six months to assess various aspects. You know, has it improved your physical activity? Has it improved your mental health? And do you now have a healthy microbiome? And these are the outcome measures. So the primary ones will be, have there been a change in your overall physical activity? And we'll have Andy who will talk more about what that entails. Change in cognitive function. So we're looking for change in memory, executive function and cognition. And then the secondary aspects of this are related to you know, how willing are patients how willing are patients to undergo the procedure? Have there been any adverse effects, et cetera? And the safety. Those are all the important parts of the trial. Uh, so this is my last slide. And this just sort of summarizes where we are currently and when we hope to start. So we are currently waiting for one of the government regulatory bodies to come in and inspect the facility that we are building down in the basement to allow us to process and use human stool. So as you see at the top there, the MHRA, which is the body that licenses drugs and, and uh, regulates drug use, has deemed that uh, so human stool is a drug, it's a medicine, so it has to be prepared and administered in exactly the same conditions. So that's ultra clean facilities, and every step of the process needs to be validated and uh, recorded. So we're currently waiting for the MHRA to um, inspect our facilities. Then we can apply for the licenses and the ethical approval to undertake the study. Uh, we're hoping that if all of this comes about as shown here, then we are looking to start actually recruiting patients into the trial near the end of the summer of this year. Um, so I think as we get close to Easter, we'll know just how realistic this timeline is. But we really expect the study to be up and running later this year. And the good news is that we think we've raised all the money as well. So we're good to go. Right, so now I will pass on to um, Dr. Ngozi, who will, um, Lumago, who will talk about the safety of FMT. So I'm sure some of you have questions. Okay. Thank you. So I'm um, Ngozi Ilumogo. I'm a clinical microbiologist, and I've worked in the NHS for many, many years, and at consultant level 20 years. So infectious diseases basically is my specialty. And like Simon said, this is very much a collaboration between the clinicians and the researchers, and that's what the beautiful thing about the quadrum that is bringing together people who work in the hospital and people who work in science to make sure that we're able to translate the science into patient care. Okay, so my uh, brief this afternoon is to just um, explain the safety of the fecal microbiota transplantation that we plan to use for this study. So why do we do MA, uh, FMT for short here? It's because we are really lucky in having, within this space, this research park, the most, I would say, endowed part of collaboration between the clinicians, so next door, big hospital, science right here, food, got all the expertise within a very close proximity 
gives us this huge advantage to be able to bring this therapy in. And you might be surprised to hear that there are very few centers in the UK that can actually do fecal microbiota transplantation. I know there are you know, reports in the media of people doing this in their own home out of desperation, but that is really not to be recommended because um, there are some risks which I am going to highlight and I will explain to you how we mitigate those risks. So I'm not going to dwell on this because um, Simon's dealt, dealt with it, but I'll just mention the last part, which is it's not just humans um, uh, who have used other people's feces, but actually, if you look in the animal kingdom as well, you will find that there are certain baby animals that eat their mother's feces to be able to get bacteria into their own gut so that they can metabolize and digest food. So it's quite a practice that is um, widespread in nature, and that is called coprophagia. And if you are an animal lover and you've got pets, you're probably familiar with this. It's quite interesting when I saw this to say oh. that there is <laughs> actually um, a product that people who have dogs can buy to stop their dogs running off to eat poop when they take them out walking. I thought that was quite interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, the, we have experience in doing fecal microbiota transplantation in this place. And this started on the back of the NICE guidance that was published in 2014, which gave us the approval to bring in fecal microbiota transplantation specifically for patients who have very bad Clostridium difficile infection. Can I just check, are people familiar with C. diff? How many people have heard about C. diff? Hands up. Yeah, thank you. So essentially, it's a disease that's, brought, that, that's mainly brought about by as a side effect of antibiotics. So antibiotics decimates the gut microorganisms, like the um, uh, slide that Simon showed you about the lung being completely denuded. That's what antibiotics can do. And before FMT, we would use more antibiotics to try and treat the C. diff which doesn't make a lot of sense, but we didn't have anything else. But as soon as FMT uh, became approved, we thought, yes, we now have a tool that can actually bring cure and give that gut microbiota micro, uh, the opportunity to reestablish itself and become colonized with healthy bacteria. So NICE gave that recommendation because they looked at the evidence, and particularly the first randomized control trial that was published by the Amsterdam group in 2013 that showed that FMT was both efficacious and safe. So that efficacy is in relation to Clostridium difficile, but I'm here to just emphasize the safety component of it. So that is to say that NICE has actually looked at FMT and they deemed it safe within certain parameters. And if you read further, you will see that it's saying that clinicians have to be involved and make sure that there is clinical and safety governance around the whole process. So that is what I bring to the trial as a clinician to say, how do we make sure that the donors are well selected, that the stool samples are screened properly, and that we have traceability to be able to go back if we needed to check something. Do you agree that that's quite a good thing? To be able to go back if there was an issue to say, okay, where might this have arisen? And I'll just pause a bit and maybe remind people, because this was quite high profile recently, where there's, there was the, um, uh, the, the, the court cases just talking about the unfortunate blood bomb virus um, scandals, quote and unquote, where people were inadvertently infected with HIV and Hep C. So I see people nodding. So that is not that long ago, it's still very fresh in our memories. And so we are very cautious as clinicians that when we bring in new therapy, we absolutely must make sure that the safety aspect is considered. Because again, as doctors, when you graduate, the first oath you take is first you do no harm. So whilst you want to improve patients' quality of health and you know, improve, uh, bring care where possible, the starting position always is the safety aspect that you do not complicate people's lives by um, causing harm. Okay, so I'm just going to skip those through. 
So the stages in our FMTs, you can see there are quite a number of things that we do. But the first thing really is that the donors that we use for the feces that we use for the transplantation comes from healthy, at the minute, scientists that work within this park. So I have made a decision not to use clinicians because as clinicians or people who work in the hospital, we are in contact with patients all the time. So that means that we could inadvertently pick up something and it's more difficult for me then to have the peace of mind that what I'm preparing is going to be you know, free of pathogens. So we've chosen to use scientists who are motivated, who understand the importance of donating and who are committed and who are coming to the place anyway so it's a bit easier, um, but who are also incredibly supportive of the research that we're trying to do. So that's where we get our donors from. And I'm just going to show you a, a slide about the initial questionnaire that we do. So we put out a call to say, you know, we want people to join our donor register within the park, and people contact me, you know, confidentially to say, yes, I'm interested. And the very first thing I ask them is this whole questionnaire. Some of the questions are a bit intrusive, but we need to know if somebody's got a risky lifestyle, for instance, you know, if somebody um, fortunately uses drugs, we know that that could be a risk for blood borne viruses, and then there are a whole list of, um, say about that one, gastrointestinal comorbidities, which we want to exclude just from the history. So before we even start to say, you know, we want to screen the, the donor, we have to go through these, every single one of them, and make sure none of those apply. So some of those are absolute, and so some of them are relative exclusions. So a relative exclusion, for instance, could be that somebody has been to, is, is just come back from the developing world, for instance, where they might have traveler's diarrhea, because we know that's more common, and then we need to wait at least six months before they can join. Or somebody's just had antibiotics, and you know, three months, uh, we need to wait at least three months to make sure that their gut flora has been reestablished. So we do the questionnaire first of all and ask lots of um, history. And if none of these applies and it's absolutely clear, we then invite them, we'll go through a consent, a very de detailed consent process. And I do this personally because I need those donors to think about the possibility of a result which they didn't think that they might be harboring. And I think that's really important. So whilst people want to support the study that we do, they've got to be really informed and think about how that might change their lives if they were suddenly found to be hepatitis C positive, which they didn't even know that they had. So I go through that and I give them the forms and they say, go away, think about it. And if you're really you know, up for it, then you can come back. And then when they come back and they're ready and we sign the constant forms, we then ask, um, I, I do the blood forms and they go to a phlebotomy to collect blood for general um, checks, so things like electrolytes and urea, liver function tests, your CRP, which is a marker of inflammation, and then more specific tests, screening for all these uh, pathogens here. Now, there are now UK and European guidelines about um, FMT, which has been published in the last couple of years. We, at this site, actually do more than what's in the national guidelines, which you know, we, were con we contributed to. So some of the things that are extra are that we screen for drug-resistant organisms. Now, a standard spectrum beta-lactamases, many of you, I don't expect you to know about them, are drug-resistant bacteria that can live in the gut. They, may, they don't cause symptoms, but they just sit there. And as a clinical microbiologist, I do not want to infuse feces that's got any resistance that I can identify. So we screen for those. We screen for vancomycin-resistant enterococci, which also lives in the GI tract. We, we screen for MRSA, which I think many of you will be familiar with because it's been so much in the news. And some people can carry MRSA in their gut as well. And then we screen for carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae. In addition to the food poisoning organisms that you all will be familiar with, Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, we use molecular methods now to test for these, which means that it's really sensitive, so we do a PCR. So it doesn't have to be that they are viable or alive. I just want to know if they're there at all, 
then we can pick them up. So I am really reassured that our screening te uh, methods are very robust and will pick up even small fragments. So that's the, 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 the kind of panel of tests that we run um, in the lab before we even accept any donation. And I'm going to, so very briefly, the method that we do here is to use the nasojejunal tube. So that's a tube that we put endoscopy downstairs, we put a tube down through the stomach and into the small intestine. And the idea being that we want to infuse the material into the small intestine and then it can go through to the large intestine and you have a longer route for it to, to, to work. There are other methods of administering fecal microbiota transplantation. There are places that might choose to put it in the stomach and they will do a smaller volume or to use the bottom end and do a sigmoidoscopy. And um, there are a few cases that we've had to do um, those if we felt the patient was not suitable for upper um, GI tube insertion. So that's just the, the final product, the way that we package it. And we just put it in these really beautiful syringes. And uh, <laughs> it's come after your lunch, but hopefully you don't get squeezed or anything. And uh, we then go across to the patient's bedside and infuse that into the tube, which is put through the nose, and like I explained earlier. So that's the delivery route that we use uh, most of the time. But occasionally, we can use other routes as well, uh, particularly in treating Clostridium difficile, if we perceive there is a risk of putting a tube through the um, uh, upper uh, uh, entry route. So by way of side effects now, if you look through the literature and in our experience as well, there are some minor side effects that people get when you give them, you know, any material that you put into somebody's tummy anyway. So things like belching, some abdominal cramps, some uh, tummy pain. And there are risks that come from the root of administration. And that's also something that will come out of the clinical assessment before the root of FMT is, is chosen. Um, so if somebody, for instance, has issues maintaining their upper airway, then you don't want to give them upper uh, GI endoscopy. So there are risks associated with the tube insertion itself, uh, which is done by the gastroenterologist downstairs. There is, of course, the possibility of an infection, which is why NYSA said this has to be done within a clinical setting and which I have explained how far we go to screen a whole list of things. You know, there are things which we don't know, which we can't screen about, or they're screened for, but at least I think it's something that people have to understand that at this moment in time, everything that we know we ought to be screening about, screening for, we are screening for. And to give that extra assurance, we've got a biorepository within the site as well where we store aliquots of the feces that the, don that, that the donors give, and we, we for C. diff patients, we also store their own feces, so that if there was a complication or a complaint further down the line, we can actually retest this, the donor, the specific um, sample that was donated, not the one that we tested before they became a donor, but the one they donated on the day, which is stored indefinitely at the minute, we can go back to it in frozen aliquots in the biorepository, uh, as well as the, um, the one from the from the patient themselves. So um, in our hands, it is, very, it is very safe. And there are also some future developments that, that can happen. But of course, intervening, using it as a tool to study ME is what we are um, discussing today. But it is a very new and exciting area of research. And I think the potential is definitely um, huge. And this is one of the ones I like to um, show to my, to my CD patients when we talk about because you've got to consent the patient as well to give them FMT. And I said, well, feces is a natural product. You know, it's not, it's not a pharmaceutical agent in that sense, even though the MHRA has categorized it for purposes of clinical trials as an investigational medicinal product, which is why we're applying for the MHRA license to be able to do the trial. But if you actually think about it, it wasn't, it's not being given the same um, uh, definition when it comes to using it for Clostridium difficile because they've allowed us 
to use it without calling it a drug in that sense. Um, but that's the way that they've chosen to, to do it. And that's the same way that Europe has gone because you know, we have Europe-wide collaboration and, and that's, that's um, what it is at the minute, categorized as a medication, but it is a natural product. And I say there is no supply problem. There usually isn't. So we, we, can, we can often get um, as much as we want so long as we arrange it in advance, which is good. Um, well, you know, I said there is no direct cost because the, the colleagues and the scientists who've been supporting the treatment we've been, give, we've been given here, uh, we haven't had to pay them anything because that's just, um, the NHS doesn't pay donors, we don't pay blood donors, so why would you pay f f people who donate feces? I said there is no overdose, so unlike a medication where you might find you've taken too much, there isn't really an overdose for FMT, and there is no underdose either, but we have the standard dose that we um, use uh, at, at the present time. And of course, because it's not a medication, there is no drug interaction, so I can't think of any other clinical trial that you sign up to, that you wouldn't have a long list of check with medications. Are you on this, are you on that, and the other? And how the trial medication may interact with your current medication. Luckily, that's not actually an issue with this sort of um, uh, therapy or trial. Um, so, you know, there's a whole list of advantages here and things that makes FMT lend itself clinically to this sort of trial, and, and we're really excited about that. And uh, finally, I think it would just be to emphasize again that this is very much a team effort. I've got other clinical colleagues, so I'm the lead clinician for FMT. But I have, I collaborate with some of the gastroenterologists. I've got older people medicine consultants, and we all work together just to make sure that the treatment is um, available and, and to, to, to uh, see the patients who need it at the moment. And that will be the same thing when we come to use them for clinical trials. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, my name is Andy Akin. I'm one of the team that will be helping to deliver the Restore Me trial. And my particular area of specialism is in the measurement of physical activity, which, as Simon mentioned, is going to be one of the key outcomes for the study. So I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about what we mean about physical activity and how we're proposing to measure it in the trial. So very briefly, these are the things that I'm going to cover. I'll say a little bit to begin with about who I am and what I do. I'll talk about what I mean when we say physical activity and how we'll be kind of defining it and characterizing it in the trial, how we'd like to measure it, and then I have some questions for you so that we can ensure that our methods uh, are as relevant and as convenient for you as possible. So I'm a lecturer in behavioral epidemiology at the University of East Anglia. I'm based in the Edith Cavell building, which is just a couple of minutes walk down here. It just happens to be my office there. And uh, behavioral epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of behaviours, so patterns and influences on behaviour. My particular interests are in physical activity and sedentary behaviour, so essentially moving and sitting. And I'm interested in how much time people spend in these different behaviours, which groups of people spend more or less time in these behaviours, and then the factors that influence uh, engagement in these behaviours, so personal factors, social and environmental factors, and so on. So, I am approaching this from an, from an epidemiology perspective. I don't have prior kind of training or experience with ME. I'm relying on Simon and the rest of his team to provide that kind of clinical expertise. But what I do have is uh, many years of experience in collecting, processing, and analyzing physical activity data, and that's my particular niche in the team. I thought it might be useful just to clarify what I mean when I talk about physical activity because it's often used interchangeably with other terms, maybe exercise or fitness and so on. So what I mean with physical activity is essentially any form of movement produced by the contraction of our muscles. And so I 
from that, I'm sure you can gather that it's a very broad construct. It encapsulates all forms of movement. So it would include things like sport and structured exercise, going to the gym, playing in a sports team or something like that. But it's certainly much broader than that. It certainly isn't that alone. So it incorporates everyday activities, the things we have to do just to get through the day. Climbing stairs, going to meetings, making a cup of tea, going to the shops and so on. Also incorporates occupational tasks, things we have to do to fulfill our job, either getting to work, lifting and carrying at work. And then also includes active hobbies as well, whatever those things might be, whether that's gardening, going out with our friends or family, walking the dog, etc. So it's a very broad construct. You might be interested to know that the very first studies that looked at the link between physical activity and health were actually <coughs> conducted in, in the occupational context. Jeremy Morris, who was a, a scientist based uh, in London in the 50s, his first studies compared the rates of heart disease in bus drivers who spent most of their day sitting relative to bus conductors who spent most of their day walking up and down stairs on a double-decker bus, selling and checking tickets. And he found that the bus conductors had much lower rates of heart disease than the bus drivers. And from there, uh, a very significant, huge evidence base has since accumulated demonstrating the benefits of physical activity for both physical and mental health. One of the most interesting things about research in physical activity, one of the most challenging things about research in physical activity is that it can be described, characterised in lots of different ways. It's what we would refer to as a, a multidimensional construct. So you could describe someone's activity patterns with regard to their frequency, how often someone is doing activity of any kind. Clearly that's only a part of the picture. You might also want to capture their duration, how long we spend doing things. And those two things combined would give us a really good indication about kind of someone's overall activity levels, the overall volume of activity that they do. We could also reflect on and consider the intensity, the amount of relative muscular effort that's required with the activity. Clearly weightlifting, being a front row in a game of rugby is very different from doing yoga, going swimming, and so on and so on. And that relative amount of effort has implications for health, but it also has important implications for how long it might take us to recover from doing those things and how appealing they are to different people. We might also want to consider the particular type of activity. Is it recreational, occupational, is it sport, or so on. Timing is an in interesting element within physical activity. The time of day that people are active or prefer to be active, the day of the week and the season of the year and so on, all being elements that are interesting to look at there. And also we could consider the context of physical activity as well. Some people like to be active on their own, some people prefer to be active with their friends and family as members of teams, some people prefer to be active at home, in the woods, in with nature, at a sports club or so on. So, there are lots of different ways that we might characterise activity and for many years we relied almost entirely on questionnaires to try and characterise people's physical activity and I think y you will see that for a construct with so many different dimensions it's incredibly challenging to try and capture all of that within a questionnaire. Your questionnaires can very quickly get long and complicated. Uh, and that, of course, becomes very burdensome for your participants. They might lose interest, maybe not give you as accurate information as they might. And also, some of our physical activities are very trivial, incidental parts of the day. They're just hard to remember. So that's very challenging from a, from a, a, a reporting point of view. So in, in the research context, and also in the commercial context, as many of you will be aware, over the last 10 or 15 years ago, that 10 or 15 years or so, there's been huge growth in the use of activity monitoring devices to measure activity patterns. Usually when I look around a room at this point, there'll be somebody with a Fitbit or an iWatch or something like that. Lots of devices out there. 
and they've become, wherever possible, the preferred and standard method in physical activity research of measuring people's activity behaviours. And the real benefit of an activity monitor is that it can capture lots of these different dimensions simultaneously in very high resolution and with relatively little burden upon the participant. We're still relying on people to wear it. We're still relying on people to tell us when they've taken it off. But aside from that, they're relatively convenient and you get much higher quality data than you do from a questionnaire. So I imagine by now some of you, maybe all of you, will have noticed that there's something that looks a bit like this on your table. That is a gene active and it is the device that we are proposing to use in the Restore Me trial. Please do take a look at it, pick it up, have a fiddle with it, try it on. It's there for you to experiment with, to look at. They're pretty robust, so don't worry about it. Just get in there, have a look. It is a triaxial accelerometer, and that means that it measures movement in along three axes, so up and down, side to side, and forwards and backwards. So along those three dimensions, along those three axes, we can do a really good job of characterizing people's activity. <clears throat> so gene actives are waterproof. They're also small enough and light enough that they can be worn for 24 hours a day, for many days. They've got uh, sufficient battery life, sufficient memory that they can be worn continuously without the need to recharge, without the need to download any data. So the, the, the goal is you put it on and forget about it and then hand it back to the team after however long that wear period is, usually about a week. The devices on the table are set up to be worn as a, as a watch and that's the most common placement, that's the most common way they're used, but it's not the only, only way. Um, they come with a, a choice of different straps and so on, and they can be worn in a whole variety of places. Waist is a, a popular point of attachment, as is the thigh, sometimes on the ankle, on the upper arm, or on the back. And the choice of placement is determined by what particular element of physical activity we might be interested in capturing and on the, the preferences of those people who are taking part in the study. And we'll come on to that later. I'd like to get your thoughts on, on that later on. Accelerometers, like the Gene Active, have been used very widely in population health research, in epidemiology, lots of observational studies and clinical trials. Um, as you will no doubt know much better than I. There is not a huge amount of research that has been conducted with people with ME, but I know of at least one ongoing randomized control trial that is using this same device, the Gene Active, to assess physical activity in participants. And I know of a handful of other studies, both trials and observational studies, that are using similar devices, different brands, but essentially the same technology, the same sensors to measure activity in people with ME. So they're very widely used, very well established methods and protocols for collecting and processing the data. I wanted to just briefly show you what the data from an accelerometer looks like. And this is where research grade devices differ from those commercial devices. If you have had a chance to look at it on the table, you'll see that it doesn't have a screen, it doesn't have a readout. It won't tell you at any point how many steps you've done, how much activity you've done, or how much sitting you've done on that day. And that's because in order to do that, your Fitbits and your iWatches have to do lots of internal signal processing. They have to clean the data, process it, run algorithms, and so on. And the people who make these devices are very protective over their data processing algorithms. Understandably so, it's their intellectual property. 
So they don't publish how they come to their summary estimates, how they simplify all of that data and give you a, a simple minutes or steps. Uh, as a scientist, as researchers, we can't do that. We can't keep things secret. We have to be very open about the data we collect, how we handle it, and how we process it. So for a research grade <coughs> device like the Gene Active, we just get the raw acceleration signal, the raw output from the signal that captures the movement. And this is one way of kind of visualizing that raw data. Another way is an enormous spreadsheet just of ones and zeros, but that's nowhere near as interesting to look at. So here you will see traces in three different colors. That is the movement that's captured along those three different axes. So one for up, down, side to side, forward and backwards. There's a line across the middle here, a virtual line at least, with, with a zero indicating zero acceleration, i.e. no movement. And as the line deviates up and down from that zero line, that is indicating movement of greater or lesser intensity. So although we have three, three separate figures here, three separate graphs, it's actually all the same data, just different segments on it, just zoomed in or out. This top one here characterizes movement from one person for an entire 24-hour period. So we have hour zero here, midnight, coming right through till 8 o'clock, and then so on until midnight at the end of the day. You can see that between hour zero and hour five, 5 a.m., very little movement there. Not much registering on any of those axes. This person is very reasonably asleep. And you can see much more intense patterns of movement during the day. If we zoom in on this little red box here, we get this. So this is a little snapshot, a zoomed in segment of one hour of the day. And you can see there's still very intense, very large amount of data that we can look at here. Mostly not really moving around very much for most of that hour. And then a big spike of movement for a few minutes, around 50 minutes, where this individual obviously got up and, and did something, did some kind of activity. And then it drops down to, to very little movement again. Again, we could then take this little red box and zoom in again and go into even greater detail, even more uh, specific insight into what that person was doing over just a 60 second period. And the reason I show this is just, is just to really kind of emphasize and illustrate the point of why accelerometers are our chosen method in the trial, why they're so valuable, because they pr provide such a huge volume and richness of data about people's activity patterns. <coughs> so what can we do with this accelerometer data? It can give us a very simple estimate of someone's overall activity patterns. We essentially sum up the time across all of those different axes, not so much time, but acceleration across those times, and it gives us a simple summary measure about how active someone is. We could also look at time spent in particular intensities. You can employ some thresholds along those different axes, and that will give you an estimate of how long someone is, might be spending sitting, someone might be spending walking or doing more vigorous activities. And because all of the data is time-stamped, we can look at patterns within the day or across the entire wear period. So if someone wears it for a week, we could compare their activity patterns in the morning versus in the evening on weekdays versus the weekend and so on. So it provides us with incredibly detailed, really rich data, far more than could ever be conceivably possible with a questionnaire. I wanted to also flag what it doesn't tell us, because you might very reasonably be a little bit concerned that we have all of this information about you. And so I thought it useful to flag what it won't tell us. There is no technology within this device to use global positioning systems. And there are no cameras or video recording equipment. We won't know where you are or who you are with. And it also won't tell us what you are doing. 
won't tell us the particular activity, the type of activity you're doing. So you could well be walking the dog, you might be in the shops, you might be in the swimming pool, you might be just doing some activity at home. We don't need to know that for the purposes of the trial and this device won't measure that, won't tell us that. Okay, here we go. So. Yes, it, I think it would be preferable if, if it was just those with ME who answered this, please. Doesn't matter if we've got one or two in there, I don't think. Okay, 35, does that sound about right from what we saw yeah. earlier? How do I get the answer? Well, outstanding. <laughs> If we'd have had a lot, of, uh, a lot of threes there, that would have given us a problem. Okay, next question. Okay, anybody else still thinking? One more. Okay, good stuff. Okay, excellent. So risk seems to be a popular choice. That is more or less the, the, the kind of standard, um, kind of the starting point for, for using these things. It's certainly the most convenient, least burdensome. Okay, and last one, I think. We can derive lots of things from this data. It would be interesting to get a sense of which of these you would personally be most interested in. Okay, any more? So overall activity level, quite a strong preference with a handful looking at other things as well. Okay. In many ways, overall activity is the, is the most robust, the most reliable outcome that we can derive from this. It requires the least interference from our point of view, the least processing, fewer algorithms, fewer assumptions from that point of view. So that's encouraging. Can you hear me? Lovely. So I'm Jo Wiggins. This is Louise Halliday. We are two of the um, specialist occupational therapists from the Norfolk and Suffolk ME service um, run by East Coast Community Healthcare. So I'm just going to run through a little bit about how the service currently is. We've got a couple of questions and then we're going to talk a little bit more about recruitment. So we are currently an outpatient service uh, for both adults and children, um, offering a variety of in clinic appointments, emails, home visits, telephones. We uh, consist of uh, two GPs with special interest and a number of OTs and physios, 10 at the moment. Um, we're commissioned by all of the CCGs in Norfolk and Suffolk. So we see patients, anybody who has a GP in Norfolk and Suffolk, we see. We hold clinics currently at these different locations. So Lowestoft, Raydon, which is in Suffolk, Stowmarket, Great Yarmouth, Alsham, Norwich and Kings Lynn. And we offer a variety of input around pacing, activity management, rest and relaxation, lots of things that you all know about already, I'm sure. So let's do a, we'll do a question. So would you like to, not my staff over there, you two are not allowed. <laughs> you two are not allowed to. Um, how many new referrals do you think we received last year? Okay, so yeah, so well, the majority of you are right. So last year we had 962 new referrals. Um, so that is fairly similar the last couple of years. Um, that's up threefold from 10 years ago. So 10 years ago we were averaging about 350 referrals a year. Um, we're now nearly averaging 1,000, looking like we'll hit 1,000 referrals this year. Thank you. 
And again, so how many active patients do you think that we currently are seeing in the service? Yeah. Lovely. Oh, oh. Did you two vote at the end? <laughs> Yeah, so again, so as of, I checked this morning before I left, so as of this morning we had 1,776 patients currently active within the ME service. Between, so, the, between the 10 of us, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, again, is fairly, fairly consistent, people moving in and out, but we fairly consistently sit at around 1,800 active patients. So... Um, the current pathway as it stands, um, as Simon said previously, they're aiming to recruit 160 patients. So they're recruiting through us, so that can include both current patients of the service and people who've previously seen, been seen by the service and have a diagnosis of ME-CFS. Um, so people who have previously been seen by us but aren't currently active don't need to be re-referred to the service um, to be put forward for the study. Um, We've, we've set up a system, so if people ring up and they're interested, we can add them to a list, and then once Simon gives us the, the go-ahead, we will contact you with some more information to um, see if you're still interested, um, but people don't need to be re-referred to access that. So, again, as of this morning, we already had 60 people who've expressed an interest and are on a list kind of waiting for more information. Um, the current plan is that patients will be assessed... Um, by one of the senior members of the team, probably a telephone assessment um, to ensure that they meet the recruitment criteria, which we'll come to in a second. Um, and again, patients who are already currently active will be asked as part of the kind of normal appointment process. Um, and obviously some of these things are also a way of ensuring that other people have access and know about the study that's going on. So, Let's run through these. So inclusion, so people have to be 18 years old, so no children. Um, it will cover, or it can cover the whole severity of the spectrum of ME-CFS. Um, I know she talked about Barbara before, obviously people who are severely affected, it's going to be more difficult for them because they will have to get here. Um, but that you don't have to be somewhere on the spectrum. Um, you can be anywhere on the spectrum. Um, that's something that Simon is still looking at. Symptom duration, again, currently is suggested 2 to 15 years. Um, so as a team, we've discussed with Simon that whether perhaps cutting off at 15 years is perhaps too, what's the word, too small, too low, um, and that perhaps that would actually cut off quite a number of patients that we would see. Um, and we have quite a lot of people who, who have been ill for longer than 15 years or who we've seen for longer than 15 years. Um, so that's something that Simon is again, discussing with the, the European clinicians group. Um, so that may, that may change as the process moves along. Do we, disease coincident with clinically diagnosed gastro... So that basically means that you can have IBS or a gastro disorder. That's absolutely fine. Um, so the exclusions. Um, so you can't have kidney failure. You can't have congestive heart failure. You can't be immunocompromised on, or on immunosuppressive drugs. Um, you can't have another disease that may explain ME-CFS symptoms. Um, hopefully that would have been part of your diagnostic process in the first place. Um, you can't have used antibiotics in the last three months. You can't be pregnant or breastfeeding. You can't have serious endogenous depression. So again, we've discussed this with Simon, so that's about people who are seriously clinically depressed. Probably the majority of people who we see who may have developed mild, moderate depression as part of their illness, um, that's not going to be an exclusionary criteria. Um, you can't have a chronic infectious disease, so HIV, hepatitis B or C, um, and you can't have had a major kind of lifestyle change in the last three months. So you can't have introduced new food supplements, you can't have had a major change in diet, so for example, gone vegan or started an anti-candida diet. Um, or any introduction of any new medications within the last three months. Is that everything? Oh, God, that, yeah. was, that was quick, wasn't it? <laughs>
obviously more questions, but there is one a additional question, which is probably an obvious one. So based on what you've heard today, um, would you be willing to undergo the procedure and be involved in the trial? Just any patients or any patients? ME patients. Okay, 22, 23, any more, any more? Well, that's pretty overwhelming. 92%, excellent. Okay, so that concludes the sort of event, the presentations, but um, if any of you do have remaining questions, I think all the speakers, in, yeah, and Gozi's here, great. Um, so I encourage you to approach them and ask any more questions. We will be posting updates as we make progress with putting the trial into place. So clearly the most significant obstacle, well, barriers, I guess, would be obtaining all the necessary approvals. Once we have those in place, then we can seriously start to get the trial going and recruit patients. And I hope as many of you as possible will be joining us in the trial, I think. Very exciting. Um, so thank you again for all coming.